If you thought the Oscars were the only award-winning content you didn't follow, follow along on today's Lockdown Guardians to be more depressed. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I am Jeff. That is Justin. Let's get into things. I want to thank you for making Lockdown Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever you get podcasts. And I want to say that we have your team covered every day, uh, or at least six days a week here. And yes, I have different headphones. Um, I keep busting headphones. I, I, I don't know. I, I hulk out way too much. Uh, you got but, mad about what we're about to talk about today. That's what you I, got mad I about, to be honest. Got, so we're going to talk some more TV stuff. Um, we found out basically that four teams were not worth their contracts. And for all the years of people talking about the Cleveland guardians, uh, having a bad TV contract, they have a bad TV. Well, it turns out it was bad for everyone because they were a negative one of four teams with negative value. Um, they highlighted the Padres as one of, as the worst one. Uh, I didn't look up. I should have looked to see the Padres Instead, I did math that we'll get into later in this discussion. I wouldn't found like the percentage based on estimated revenue, you know, we'll get to it, but as long yeah, as you the, did the math, not me. Yeah, no, I, I sat and did the math for fun. Um, while my daughter read me fun books too. because that's that's you know, I, I sit on the floor and she read, reads me books during bedtime. That's where we are now. So then I was like, okay, I'm gonna look up some things because my job is to answer every question wrong so she can scold me. Um, but with the loss of this, it's interesting the four teams for sure that they want to get out from that Bally's and Diamonds have no interest from Cincy, San Diego, Arizona and Cleveland. And I also, you know, we talked so much about Bally's. I didn't realize like AT&T had a deal and it's essentially getting rid of a bunch of theirs as well. So this whole RSN thing is a big deal because uh, I mean, you have what 14 MLB teams that are in Bally's and then another four that were with this AT&T. So that's 18. That's over half the league. People are running to get out of these TV deals. So TV money is a big part of revenue. It is a bigger driver than ticket sales right now. So when you look at it, the fact that all of that looks like it was overvalued, that the overall revenue of baseball is probably going to decline a bit. Looking at an estimate of their 2021 revenue, which was about 261 million, maybe it's 267 million, can't remember top of my head, uh, which again, you can look at that and be like, wow, they're really not spending anywhere near that. But you also have to take into account, there's a lot of other things also baked in that money, cost of coaches, cost of front office, um, Paying people, but again, I, I don't think that really makes up for the other two hundred plus million that they were on pace to uh, to make. But of that, if you look at the low end estimate of what they made, which is about thirty seven million from their TV contract, that'd be about fourteen percent. High end at fifty two, that'd be about nineteen percent. So at the end of the day, uh, now they're not going to get no money, but right now until we know what they will get from the new deal, which I'm going to let Justin talk about here in a moment, it's looking like somewhere between fourteen to nineteen percent less total and then whatever they get will help make up for that but justin you sent me the original article well i've talked about kind of the background why don't you explain what they're going to do so people can watch baseball well we don't know <laughs> that's essentially the answer nobody knows i don't know i don't know if baseball knows uh the article is from the new york post they will include the article in the description of the the show today so you can go read for yourself and uh, a lot of this reporting also came from the Sports Business Journal. So Sports Business Journal and the New York Post, as far as information is concerned, pretty reputable, especially Sports Business Journal. New York Post, you know, for the most part as well, but uh, very reputable sources. And it's very possible that they don't have all the information yet because all the information is not even available. And there's going to be uh, updates as, as baseball figure this things out. So don't don't go jumping off the cliff. Don't don't pull your car to the side of the road and have a panic attack, you know. There's going to be more information to come out. This is just what we know right now. This is just all that is being allowed to leak out. Major League Baseball didn't even respond for, to comment for any of these articles. So this is all just sources. But uh, part of the bankruptcy proceedings is going to reject the contracts of at least four teams to collect back. Uh, that it collect cause, Because, like Jeff said, because they get less money back than they're paying out to the RSN. And one of them is Cleveland. Um, Mod Ranford has said the league will take over local broadcasts of money-losing teams and stream them for free 
in their respective local markets as he negotiates their cable companies for lower contracts, a source with a knowledge of discussion said. However, this is where it gets murky. Major League Baseball has not finalized plans for how fans in blacked out markets, which would be Cleveland, will be able to view the free games. Currently, fans can pay to watch out-of-market games on MLB TV. So Major League Baseball has not has not uh, commented on the situation yet. So Major League Baseball is saying they're going to step in and they're going to take over broadcasts for the teams that are losing money on their being kicked out of their contracts because of the bankruptcy by Diamond Sports Group. Cleveland is one of those teams, but they do not have a plan for how fans that would be blacked out of those games are going to be able to watch them locally. And I assume that Major League Baseball at some point is going to have to have a plan for this. They're going to have to have some sort of comment on, on what's next for this because you can't have, especially Padres fans, let's be honest, the Padres are the only show in town in, in San Diego. They are spending money like crazy, which makes you wonder, can they keep this up now? Um, not that I care because, you know, the guys, we don't care about the owners. Let them spend money and figure out later. But um, you can't have these teams not watching their games in market. We're talking about a sport that already has a hard time getting people to join in and watch their sport that aren't interested now. Now you're talking about a, a segment of people who want to consume these games and you can't get it in front of them because of issues. That's a problem. And I don't know that I trust major league baseball to do the right thing by their fans, because let's be honest, have, do they always people are, you know, we thought the blackout rules were a problem, right? Like they have been a problem. And, and we, and then when all this RSN money blowing up came to light, it was saying, Oh, well, the reason that, the blackout rules even exist and have been a problem for a while is because of these RSN deals. Once the RSN deals crash, like they are, MLB can get rid of blackouts and get, you know, people can stream games digitally um, as they would out of market games. But as of right now, there's, they haven't finalized plans. Okay. So I shouldn't say they don't have a plan. They haven't finalized them. So just, I'm going to take a deep breath myself here for a second, but they're still working on plans for how, how you're going to be able to watch the game in market. And I don't know how soon this is going to happen. They're talking about um, bankruptcy happening on March 17th, which is before the season even starts. And the other thing I will note for our buddy, Andre Naughton, for everybody else uh, on broadcast, that the idea is that, ma that Major League Baseball is going to keep their broadcast teams uh, that are already on, on payroll and on part of the channel whenever they do – continue to find the new plan. So they're going to take over the broadcasts and they're going to keep local announcers when they take over. So that's, that's a good thing there, but I don't know. I just, I have a lot of questions and I have a lot of the uh, uneasy feelings about how this is going to be handled. Maybe, maybe it'll turn out really good. Maybe some people think this is going to be a good thing. And I think long-term, this is going to be a good thing. It's going to be less money for the teams, but I, I think in the short term, it's going to be a little bit shaky and a little bit concerning until we get some answers. That's why I said it sounds murky. It's not bad. There's no reason to jump off a bridge, but you know, it's just right now it's, it feels a little bit un uncertain, which you don't like. I think, you know, just looking over it and looking, one of the big things to point out too is uh, this whole situation with diamond and Bally's is they refuse to cut loose all 14 teams. So they're only cutting right now, these four Cleveland's one of the four that is cut and the other three teams, which were Houston, Pittsburgh and Colorado from the AT&T sports net, those are still going to be aired on AT&T Sportsnet for now. Uh, but it's only four teams. So Major League Baseball has to figure something out for a smaller group. So it may not be as much of a rush for them when it is that small group. Uh, and the other interesting thing is seeing what the price point's going to be when this happens. Um, you know, same article talks about the fact that the Boston Red Sox essentially charge 30 bucks a month to watch their games. Valleys charge 20 a month to watch their games. If you're looking over the course of a whole season, that's going to be more than MLB TV is for an entire season of games. But I would not be shocked if that's what they end up going for, something at like 20 bucks a month. Or, you know, if you buy the whole season, it's like one payment less type of deal. But it's going to be interesting to see something is going to come because they're going to have to get money somehow. But I am very curious in the big picture of baseball how this is. This is going to be a big economic shift because the bubble has popped. Not only has it popped, it's shrinking. They, they really need to look at like an NFL type of situation of pulling all of it and kind of working as a, as a group instead of as separate fractions. But it's, it's certainly something to watch. 
speaking of things to watch, let's talk about our good friends over at LinkedIn. These days, potential uh, every potential new hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs help find the right people for your team faster and for free. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your jobs for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown MLB. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. All right. Well, Jeff, you sent me this article. I, I uh, it was on the Athletic by Jason Stark. I this was a a point of view on the pitch clock I had not thought about. Uh, I, I watching the games. Uh, World Baseball. I've been mostly watching World Baseball Classic. Surprise, surprise. Um, they are not using the pitch count there, and the games are taking a long time. So let me just say that. Um, the pitch clock, I think, is a bit, is a good thing because spring mm-hmm. training games have been snappy. World Baseball Classic games, as fun as they are, they are taking forever. I, I watched half an inning and then got bored and moved on. I can't. I can't. Uh, we're, gonna I, have, I, we're gonna have to have a talk about. This I watched. I watched half an inning of the Czech Republic because uh, I thought it'd be fun since they're not like full time players. And after half an inning, I was like, I'm gonna move on to something else. That's sad. That's that's going to be all I watch of the World Baseball Classic this year. I feel bad for anybody who's missing out, truthfully. I really do. It's it's not for <laughs> me. It's not for me. We'll save the World um, Baseball Classic to the end of the show because everybody loves it. For the, the three of you who are holding on. Make sure you comment below. Let's get the exact number so I can get all three names. But... Um, you know. I'm going to comment from like five different accounts okay. after this. Okay. So, but I thought um, wrong. the interesting thing in this article is that it is like taking out about 25 minutes of dead time, which is a good thing. But I think the more interesting thing is like how mound visits are like timeouts now. And that, you know, you get five plus one, I believe. And that plus one is if you've used your other five and it's the ninth. And on top of that, like we're going to see more pitch outs. Like that's happening more in games. Like if you can't come ready. Uh, to the mound in time, like it's better to throw a pitch out than you know uh, have the penalty. Those in the penalty, just a ball. So why does it matter? Do I have something wrong in my head? That was the one thing that confused me. Like why are people pitching out more? Isn't the penalty for not coming an extra ball? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So yeah. I guess it's just well, I guess if you pitch out, you can throw it onto first. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But uh, yeah, the mound visit, you got to be very, you know, you got to figure you're using of it. You gotta, you gotta kind of give yourself some safety, some room, but it's, it's a lot more like a timeout in, in the NFL and it's a lot, you have to be a lot more strategic with it. So it, it's certainly something that uh, is going to, you know, bear a lot of watching. And then, you know, one of the the minor points with this, I thought was really interesting is the importance of the bat boy all of a sudden that like they have to get these guys, their equipment, get on and off the field quickly uh, in Stark's interview. Uh, he has a podcast, I should say, that he had do you have Steve Cohen on? Gary Cohen. Told, Gary Cohen. Yeah, I told him that uh that Buck Walter is going to take his best bat boy on the road with him in order to keep equipment in the hands of the players quickly so they're better able to take advantage of the 30 seconds they have between batters. So like the bat boy matters now. <laughs> Teams are like planning to that small degree. So mound visits, pitch outs, bat boys. All things we weren't even really thinking about uh, when all of these started, but stuff that is coming up enough that like Jason Starks, one of those guys who's been writing about baseball as long as anyone, and these all came up, and I thought we have to discuss this. I'm interested in to see what happens. I mean, do teams tell their bat boys on the road? Like if you're if you don't bring your own bat boy or bat girl on the road with you, like I don't know if Buck Showalter is joking or not, but um like what if you have one that's really slow and like all right you're gonna work tonight and you're gonna you're gonna cause the other team like a couple of extra strikes because they weren't in the batter's box on time. Like can teams employ visiting bat or bat bat girls or bat boys and um that, that are move slowly and, and cost the other team? Like is that gonna be something that we, we see 
Uh, I, the, the umpires were instructed to like use common sense on weather related stuff, but um, when it comes, like I hope they are. I hope we don't see like a guy struggling to grip the ball because it's raining or it's windy or something. And he's like, "Nope, sorry, you didn't throw the pitch, even though your your hand is wet and you need to to dry it off." But I don't know. Are they going to look and see if a, a bat boy or a bat girl is moving too slowly? Like, are we going to see that? I don't know. Because well, technically, it's not supposed to be till they're off the field. The clock starts. So in a game in Detroit, they started too know. early. But it also means it could happen. Could a clock start too soon because of it? Yes. Like, is there a chance? Um, you know, and, and can that be reviewed? Like, I, I don't know. Like, you know, what is going to be the final take on how that gets handled? But we saw it happen in a spring training game. Now it's supposed to be this is to work out so things like this don't happen. Right. But if it's happening in spring training, there's a good chance we'll see at least one or two incidents during the year. I mean, yes, they were probably to a degree joking, but I do wonder if this is like something they're going to actually drill or if like a bat boy is going to become a position that like isn't necessarily, you know, is going to be a little bit more of a focus, like something where you have to to be able to to chug the game along because they're you know, it feels like something where they're going to where teams could try to take advantage of the bat boy situation. And then, you know, it, it's so much of this is going to be up for interpretation, which MLB has done such a great job of when it came to getting rid of foreign substances on pitching that I'm sure this will go fine. Right. Yeah. Uh, I've had a couple of people in my family text me over the last couple of days after seeing like news headlines and they're like, they're baseball fans, but they're not diehards. They they are fans of Cleveland, and they don't really watch anything else. But they saw the uh, what was it? The game against the Red Sox and the uh, Braves that ended in the the pitch clock violation, and they were complaining about it. And I'll I use the word complaining to overscore the real thing they were saying. But I said, you know what? I I go to I don't know twenty or thirty minor league games a season, okay, and I. I I really have yet to see on the field any negative impacts from the pitch clock. Like, Agreed. I, I would say I saw – some of it was on MLB TV and one of it was in person. I would say I remember a hand, like three or four times where there was a pitch clock violation or there was something related to that that, that impacted a moment of the game. Not a serious moment. Like I, we haven't seen if, – if somebody else has seen it, let me know if it's, if it's impacted the outcome of a game at the end of a game like that. But – I haven't seen it happen like that. I've just seen like one strike one or something like that. Um, so I really think people are going to be overblowing this. And and are we going to see some violations in April and May? Probably. I think by June, a lot of people aren't going to notice. Because I, I, I got to tell you, I, like for as many minor league games as I go to, I don't notice at all. I just don't. Um, I do think it's going to add an interesting amount of strategy. I mean, this article proves it, right? It talks about the mound visits and uh, different umpire checks for – uh, or keeping an eye on on how many mound visits you're using and just other stuff in general that maybe they they had let go unchecked for a while. Um, I don't know. I, I, teams are always going to try to find ways to exploit the rules, right? There's always a way to to circumvent things or find the uh, what do they call it the uh, the market inefficiency, right? To exploit that, so that, that will always happen and. Major League Baseball will have to adjust, and the um, and the, the important thing to remember is too the umpires are also adjusting. This is new for a lot of these umpires as well as it is some of the players. So I I just don't think that are we going to see some goofy things? Probably we'll see some goofy stuff going on early on. And are there things that Major League Baseball is going to have to address? Probably will they do good addressing it? I don't know. I mean, like you said, the the, the foreign substance thing they started off really checking hard, and then they they backed off. And now it's back on, and this will probably happen the same way. Um, I do like to use the other thing I would point out too. You said about the pitch clock is not supposed to start until the bat boy is off the field or bat girl. A lot of this leaves up to the uh, the, the ability of a pitch clock runner. Somebody in the stadium is responsible for running this pitch clock. It's like a shot clock in basketball. It's not an automated thing. It is a, a thing that someone has a job to do. So every stadium is going to have a different person running the pitch clock. So you're depending a lot on this person to be ready to go and getting things correct every time. I think that's where you leave it open to a lot of issues happening. Maybe not so much the players not being able to get used to it. That's the other thing to consider. You might think, ah, this player can't get used to it. He's slow or this batter keeps doing this. These umpires can't get it right. 
you know, it's kind of like a, a yelling at your server for the, your food being cold or being or your your food not being ready. It could be the cooks, you know, it could be the guys running the pitch clock. So uh, I think that is where there is the most gray area is how are we going to police the pitch clock operators to get this thing right? I don't know. I just I don't pay enough attention to the NBA. Does the NBA have a really tight grip on the shot clock getting right? I guess that's a little more black and white for the most part. Um like, are we, like you said, are we going to have reviews? Is it going to be like, ah, the pitch clock should not have started. Let's review what was going on and see if we can get the pitch clock. Then you're stopping the whole game to review when the pitch clock should be turned on or what it should be at. Because in the NBA, they all the time talk or have a review to reset the shot clock. Are we going to do that the pitch clock too? Like, this is where I think there's a lot of gray area that could be confusing. No, 100%. I... I, I will say if they just stick to what's worked in the minors, I can recall like, right. on, on two hands, the number of violations I saw in my time in the minors. So That's a great they, point. They will stick with that and use the system that has already been successful. And what else is successful? Well, those would be our good friends over at builtbar.com. Uh, if you don't know built bar, then what are you doing? This must be your first podcast because they've been here since darn near the beginning and their March madness bracket is back. We know you have a favorite bar or puff, and now is the time to make it count. Uh, go to BuiltBarMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. And when you vote for your favorite bar or puff, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky locked-on listeners will get a free box of Built. Not only are, are you going to enter, but I'm going to enter. Not only that, but one locked-on fan will get a 12-month subscription to Built to have the best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. you got to try Built. The best protein bar ever. And I agree with that. Even though it's written here, that is also the one that I 100% agree and run to Built Bar March. Or I'm sorry. It is builtmarchmadness.com. Uh, I will be telling you which one I think you should enter, but you definitely want to check out this competition. It is fantastic. It is you just you can't go wrong with Built Bar March Madness. You can't go wrong with Built Bar in general. I love it. Check out Built Bar. I'm sorry, builtmarchmadness.com. All right. Well, we went to get to it last week. Thankfully, there has been no injuries to anybody on Jeff's team or anybody for that matter since we've last talked, thankfully. Um, I don't know how many times we've been able to say it on the podcast where we didn't have a uh, substantial injury update, but there has been no injuries as far as we know. Um, but going back to last week, just going to throw some injury updates out there. If you haven't seen them, uh, George Valera, the one as people have asked about, he is still kind of working on T swings or dry swings, I should say. So they're, they're, I think, I think Frank Kona said the other day in his media update that, um, it's going to be a few games before you see him again. He's still just kind of working back through the symptoms. So nothing new for him, which is good. There's no new pain. Um, he, the dry swings are going well, so that's good. Uh, John Kenzie Noel, I didn't even know this had a back problem. He was out for a few games, but he had a home run on uh, Sunday. So that's good. Um, Sam Henches, they think that his progression is going to be good. Uh, I think Tito thinks that he is going to come back quickly and whenever he does is ready to pitch again, like it won't be too hard for him to catch back up and be ready. I hope, I hope they don't rush him back and get him into the bullpen like too soon. And this is a, a ongoing problem, truthfully. Um, but he, I mean, he is an important part of the bullpen and there are possibly two bullpen spots up for grabs considering Hench's injury and when he'll be ready. The Cody Morris thing is interesting. Uh, Mandy Bell had a good article of uh, MLB.com and the uh, Cleveland Guardians beat reporter, uh, talking to Tito about what to do with Cody Morris. And the topic we we've talked about the death on the show is, um, do they put him in the bullpen? Because they said, you know, it's hard to imagine, him handling a starter's workload. There's no, still no proof that being in the bullpen reduces your risk of injury. Um, but they're also, you know, just not sure about stretching him out at this point for right now and um, how they're going to handle it. So they just said they're trying to get him healthy and then they're going to decide what the role is after that. But um, yeah, there's still no proof of that. But I, I mean, I, I'm inclined at this point not to put him in the, in the rotation again. I think that, A, given how much, and we're going to talk about another rotation candidate, and we're talking about a lot of pitchers this week. We actually have, if you're listening this deep in the show, let me tell you, uh, we have a lot to talk about this week. We have a lot of topics that we just haven't been able to get to that we're going to get to. We have a lot to talk about before the start of the season. 
But uh, I would rather they have enough candidates to go to AAA anyway. Don't don't stretch Morris out as a starter. I know he could be a great starter, but don't stretch him out. Just put him in the bullpen. Hope that hope that works. You've got another enough options in AAA, and that you can call up. I say just go with the bullpen and and um, hope that is what keeps him healthy here. Yeah, I think you know we'll just have to see. I, it felt like a week ago, maybe it's just me putting. Uh, reading too deeply into things, getting my, my tinfoil hat here, a little too tinfoil late, but it felt like they were more positive on henches than I expected and a little more um, not outrightly positive, it wasn't negative on Valera than maybe I expected. So we'll have to see how it goes. Morris, I don't know. They, I can see both sides of it. I'll be curious to see what they do. Speaking of injured arms, let's talk Joey Cantillo. Um, I do want to take a moment and say, again, go back and listen to our interview with Andre Knott, where very specifically he talked about Cantillo being in camp, and they talked about basically in camp they were having him face a murderer's row of the best guys at hitting lefties this team has, and he was able to get them out. Like Jose, Ahmed, that he looked really good. And I think you and I both agree, if he'd been healthy all of last year, it would have been a big four he had a chance to be one of the top five prospects in this system. We just didn't get to see enough of it. He had the lowest hard hit percentage of any pitcher in double A or above, but it's back to back years of injuries. His stuff, you know, I, and I, I can go, you can go back on this very podcast and listen to my Mike Clevenger trade piece. Go back to when that happened. And I said, he was the number two piece in that deal for me at the time after Arias. And I thought this organization viewed him that way. It was a lot of upside, a lot of growth potential. He checked every single box for them. Uh, you know, he's not in the top 10 most places. I don't believe he was in mine. I can't remember in the discussion. I think I did up just at the end, dropping him barely out. But, you know, is he, could he, what role could he have? Yeah, I mean, you've talked about, and I think it makes sense. They're probably going to be super careful with his innings. And that's why they've kind of held him out of spring games at this point. Like he was tentatively scheduled to pitch in a game last week. And then all of a sudden he didn't pitch. And I was like, oh, what happened? And then, he got to pitch on Saturday, pitch a scoreless in, and that was good to see. And obviously, we know he's throwing on the backfields. He's not throwing in Major League uh, Cactus League games, so he's just working on the backfields. But I kind of think from our own admission, at least mine, you know, how many times in this podcast have we talked about, you know, people have been asking us about what's the best rotation you can throw out there for the Guardians this year and who what prospects could be seen make an impact this year. And I keep thinking, well, we keep talking about Espino, obviously, if he can get healthy. We keep talking about Logan Allen because Logan Allen, you know, the way Cleveland has handled their 40 man roster the last year or two and getting guys on their 40 and up before November to get him in the, in, on there and get him up for a little bit. And we've talked about obviously Gavin Williams and Tanner Bybee ad nauseum too, which is fair to them and their talent level. But I kind of feel like considering Joey Cantillo is on the 40, we've kind of left him out of the discussion. At least I have. And I'm just thinking again, like, yeah, maybe that's a guy we should be thinking about can get up this year. I, I know they're going to be cautious about his innings. And I think you're right. If he would have been healthy all year, we'd be talking about a big four. I mean, if Cody Morris was healthy, if he, well, if Cody Morris was healthy, let's be honest, he wouldn't be a, a prospect anymore. No. He'd already be in this. He would have already exhausted eligibility a year ago, likely. But, you know, if they do get healthy, you're talking about a five man rotation of prospects that are just unbelievably good. Espino and, Williams and Bybee and Allen and Cantillo and Morris like that whole group is just you know insanely talented if they're all healthy and clicking and and some of it is the injuries to Cantillo as well because obviously if he had he, had, he been healthy in 2022 or 2021 they would have been forced to put him on the 40 right they got lucky that he was hurt all year and there was no well and there was no rule five, five draft yeah yeah that's, that's really what it is let's be honest if Joey Cantillo if the rule five draft happened last year I don't think Joey Cantillo would be in this organization <laughs> Because if he got hurt last year, look at all the teams that could have easily. I think if there was um, a rule five, he wouldn't have been here. Honestly. Right. They could have easily manipulated that. Yeah. So just like uh, I, will happen with Noah Song in Philadelphia. Yeah, that's already happening. Yeah, that's yeah. they're already uh, playing with that, having back issues. But I don't know. I just kind of feel like Joey Cantillo is a guy we just haven't given enough airtime to because he is on the 40. And we've been talking about, you know, could they get Logan Allen on? Could they get Espino on? Could they get one of Bybee or Williams on they could, but Cantillo is on the Ford and he is a pretty darn good pitching prospect. And I think that we, I, I think there's a good chance we see him this year at some point. I don't I, The role I think is still to be determined. I know that's not a, an exciting answer. You asked me what the role could be, 
but uh, I think he's a guy who could make a start for them this year if they need it. I, I don't necessarily think that Curry and Gaddis are going to be their best option on any given day for a double header or just that they need a starter. Like if you're talking about one of Plesak or Savali being out for like, uh, I don't know, a month, hopefully not. But if we're talking like maybe this is June and Cantillo's back and he's healthy, I'd like to see Cantillo for a couple starts versus I know Curry and Gaddis have a little major league experience and Gaddis wasn't great, but if it's more than one start, I don't know. I like the idea of seeing what Cantillo can do for a few starts. No, I agree. And it's going to be fascinating to see how they deploy him. And uh, I've got a tin hat conspiracy. I'm going to say for another day when we talk about Ooh. how these young guys are going to um, debut. Cause I, something hit me over the weekend where I'm like, there's another reason why one of these guys probably won't hit, get the big leagues this year. And you know, it's, it's a solid tin hat conspiracy for why when we talk about these five young pitchers, the one of them, will not get anywhere near the big leagues when on top of the other reasons we've mentioned. I'm, I'm going to safely say right now there is one pitcher who will not get there. But, uh, yeah. Uh, now, here, you can. I'm going to take off my headphones, and you can talk about baseball classic here at the end. I'll just... I know. Those of you who had to suffer through the first 30 minutes of the podcast without any World Baseball Classic update, if you didn't watch, uh, well, Sunday, Paul or Cal Quantra, I almost called him Paul. Cal did not have a great start. Didn't have, have – let's be honest, Great Britain and – yeah, trade. Uh, should they trade Cal Quantrill? Like, like everyone says, with Plesak. Two one six five. No, no, no. Yeah, like, like it's gone with Naylor. According to people, then we should probably be cutting him. It's not been. Yeah, Naylor didn't have a great day for Team Canada either. Nobody in that Canada and Great Britain matchup. Jeff, this is what you missed. Um, it was a six inning game. Uh, twenty eight runs were scored, or twenty seven runs. I don't know what it was. Twenty seven runs, and uh, it lasted four hours. It was a great. It was a great game. It was like nine walks. Cal had like three of them. Didn't get out of the first inning. Didn't look great. Bo Naylor had a tough time throwing the ball, at least accurately. Uh, I would say time-wise he was fine, but accuracy was an issue. He did throw a runner out at third where the call probably should have been safe, but they reviewed it and didn't find enough evidence. But, um, yeah, so Team Canada, not great. Didn't see Cade Smith. Um, I know Diane Freya started the first game against Columbia, or for Columbia at shortstop, went 0 for 4, three strikeouts. Um, it didn't look great there, but you know, interesting that he's starting. Maybe Bruce Valoria got into a game as a pinch hitter. Richie Palacios, Team Netherlands is done, so Richie Palacios played like one game and he's coming back to Arizona here, I think probably tomorrow or soon. Um, Andres Menes is starting a shortstop for Venezuela. We're going to talk more about Andres Menes later in the week. Um, he's hit the ball pretty hard and had a couple hits so far in, in World Baseball Classic play. I'm trying to think who else has gotten into a game. Um, there's been, I'm sure there's been others I've gotten in that I am not thinking of, but, um, and someone's going to comment and be like, ah, oh, how'd you miss this guy? I don't have it all in front of me. Even, even though I am this, this, uh, podcast, this podcast networks, world baseball classic guy, apparently, if you didn't get a chance to watch Saturday or watch or listen to Saturday's episode with Sully on uh lockdown MLB. But how about you Chang, by the way, you Chang pool, a group, group, a MVP. Two homers, a grand slam, a double. Taiwan's moving on to the next round. How about you, Chang? Let's give a round of applause for you, Chang. Uh, Martin Cervenka, former uh, Cleveland minor league prospect for Czech Republic, had a couple nice games before the Czech Republic got eliminated. And um, there have been some other good uh, ex-Cleveland players that have got in. But it's been fun, man. It's been fun. If you're, miss if you're missing out, if you haven't watched the Dominican Republic and Venezuela and Puerto Rico and – Honestly, USA, they won their first game, but they haven't played exciting yet. I, <laughs> USA is not the best team in this tournament. It's Japan and Venezuela, and uh, Venezuela's been fun. Japan's been crazy. So there it is, your World Baseball Classic update. I know that everybody was waiting for that. Thank you for listening. WBC. Radio. WBC. Thank you for listening, rating, and reviewing. Uh, was it click, like, and subscribe? Uh, you know, Again, let us know. Uh, how much what baseball classic you want in the comments below and go, go guardians, go.